<clears throat> so good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to the uh, second session uh, of the uh, first day of our DHR 2021 course. Uh, I'd like to very briefly uh, introduce, um, if that's possible, uh, sir, forgive me if I leave out salient uh, uh, contributions. It's simply because I'd like them to hear you speak more than me. So uh, I'd like to, to uh, you know, heart, you know, really give a, a heartwarming welcome to uh, Professor Partha Majumdar, who is gracing us today with his presence and uh, to talk about, uh, I, I know I'm eagerly awaiting uh, 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 a talk about the sands of time. The, the title itself is intriguing. Uh, Professor Partha uh, is the National Science Chair of the Government of India. He is also a founder of the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics Institute in India and a distinguished professor in the Institute and also an emeritus professor of the Indian Statistical Introduce. Uh, I mean, I, I think just a simple Google search would give you more than I can ever say in the, in the time period, but I would like to definitely emphasize that he is um, an elected fellow of all the National Science Academies of India, the World Academy of Sciences, and the International Statistical Institute. He is currently the president of the Indian Academy of Sciences and the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. Uh, the, the awards he has received are many and uh, numerous, and, and uh, I'm sure too few anyway. So, uh, Dr. Vajumdar, uh, Professor, Sir, uh, could we please uh, begin? <coughs> I hope. Uh, you know, uh, everyone is as enthralled as I am waiting for your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I must apologize for whatever reason. I'm not able to turn my camera on. I uh, just cannot figure this out because I just took a class and everything was OK uh, using WebEx. But now uh, the same WebEx is not allowing me to turn my camera on. Um, so again, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to deliver this talk and I'm uh, very honored to be called upon uh, to give a talk in this DHR uh, workshop. Um, I have titled my talk as our footprints on the sands of time. As you might imagine that uh, this talk will be primarily about human evolution and human migrations, etc. cetera. Uh, your DHR workshop is uh, mainly focused on various kinds of diseases and uh, genes that underlie <coughs> under, underlie various uh, diseases, uh, genes and environmental factors as well. Um, but uh, uh, what, why am I giving this particular talk? Primarily because much of what our genes do and the genetic underpinnings of diseases are actually uh, embedded or enshrined in our evolutionary past. Um, so it uh, aside from the just the basic curiosity of what, where do we come from, how have we moved around, uh, it also has the other kind of um, uh, impact on the kind of work that we do um, because uh, you know our evolutionary past and our population movements have actually um, in some ways uh, determined uh, the kinds of alleles that we have, the frequencies of the various alleles at the genetic loci that we have, etc. All of which feed into our uh, ability to understand uh, the genetic basis of various diseases. <clears throat> I will um, actually come to a little bit of that at the end of my talk, how uh, evolution can impact on diseases. Again, a little bit from our own work, some from work of others, but most of the talk, 98% uh, of the talk will be on evolution and our population movements. <clears throat> our evolutionary past is very rich and uh, our evolutionary past uh, comprises not just humans, as we all know, biological evolution has taken place over millennia. Uh, I'm not going to obviously talk about uh, the entire uh, you know, time course of events or various species that have arisen, uh, but quickly going to focus on hominids and evolution of modern humans. So this is what I'm going to talk about. So let me let me start with uh, Darwin because any no talk on evolution can actually uh, do without Darwin. And let, let's just quickly review the kind of um, kind kind of um, uh, arguments that he made uh, to show that uh, humans have evolved from uh, lower animals and so on and so forth. 
All right, so let me go to my second slide, which is uh, I, I'm talking about Charles Darwin and 1859. This is the seminal book that he wrote on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. This is almost a whole sentence as the title of a book, but this indeed is the title of his book. What did he say about human evolution in this book? He said nothing in this book except to say that light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Uh, and he did not throw any light on in this particular book. Perhaps he meant that he will write another book, which he indeed uh, did a few years later, 12 years later, he wrote this book called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And here he provided some arguments about um, his contention that man descended from the great apes. And the kind of arguments that he gave were kind of were somewhat frivolous. Uh, we hardly would accept those as very uh, strong scientific evidence, but uh, this is observational um, argumentation, observations and argumentation based on observation, which is what science was at that point of time or around that point of time um, in the middle of uh, 18, 1800s. So the arguments that he gave about these, there is a correspondence, and this is argument to show or argue that man descended from the great apes. He said that there is correspondence in bodily structure between man and apes, and we all would agree that there is correspondence of, in bodily structure. He said the structure of tissues and the composition of blood are similar. I would bet that he couldn't see the composition of blood except for the color of the blood. Um, and the structure of tissues, meaning that, you know, obviously you could see hair and muscle tissue and so on. So it was very gross, but in spite of that, that was a uh, keen observation, uh, observational insights that uh, Charles Darwin had. Then he said men and apes have common parasites. Indeed, we have body louse and so on uh, as common parasites. The uh, process of reproduction is the same in all mammals. Uh, the embryo of man closely resembles the embryos of other animals, which is again other other mammals, uh, which is again true. All mammals have uh, similar looking embryos and that, that grew up to have um, to become uh, a full human being or a full animal. And it undergoes a corresponding order of development. Uh, man possesses certain rudimentary organs, muscles and other body parts. So there is an order of development that takes place as we move from an embryo to a full grown animal. Uh, and uh, this uh, corresponding order of development is the same from one individual to another. So these are the kinds of arguments and not just one individual to another, but also between um, apes and uh, human. So he, these are the these are the uh, set of arguments that he gave to um, to argue that man descended from the great apes. Uh, again, like I said, that we would consider these kinds of arguments as frivolous. But uh, please remember that these are observational, and uh, it needed a keen sense of observation or a power of observation in order to come to these kinds of um, observations and arguments. So I'm going to you know, take a great leap forward and I'm going to talk about uh, um, human evolution. <clears throat> like I said that uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to jump uh, very rapidly. Uh, my, my story comes in two parts after I've uh, done with um, you know, Darwin, who actually provided uh, these kinds of arguments. Uh, I will come to the two part story. The two part story, uh, part one begins about 5 million years ago and ends about 130, 150,000 years ago. And part two of my story begins about then, about 130,000 years ago and continues to the present day because we, we are continuing to evolve. Um, the part one of the story, which spans about 5 million years, uh, will I'll try and finish in five minutes and then spend uh, most of the rest of the talk, um, uh, you know, which, uh, on part two, which is uh, after evolution of humans, uh, how did we, uh, after we appeared, how did we evolve and how did we move around? And that's the major, major part of my talk, which is uh, footprints on the sands of time. So what happened five million years ago is just this, a, a population of African apes split into two distinct species. One of these species uh, led to the hominids, the humans, the other species, gorillas, chimpanzees, 
uh, led to uh, was another line of descent. And uh, this the, the separation between hominids and chimpanzees and gorillas took place about 5 million years ago. Each time I narrate a date or provide you with a date, it has a large um, standard deviation associated with it. So when I say 5 million years, it could be 5 million years or even 6 or 7 million years. So th those are the kinds of uh, uncertainties in dates that we have. So anyway, uh, I will stick to this 5 million years, uh, recognizing that 5 million is not sacrosanct. Um, about 5 million years ago, these two lines of uh, descent uh, split. One line of descent uh, led to the hominids that uh, is called the hominid line of descent and led to the uh, evolution of modern humans. Uh, more than 4 million years ago, one of the species on the evolutionary path to humans began spending most of its time on two feet. If we look at the apes, they spend most of the time on four feet on, on the four limbs, but we began to uh, spend most of our time on two feet about uh, 4 million years ago. And uh, the, the species, the genus that um, uh, that spent most of the time on the two feet are, is called Australopithecus. And we have uh, Australopithecus emanensis, enamensis, and Australopithecus um, uh, robustus, Australopithecus afarensis, and so on. So there are multiple species in the genus Australopithecus, but all of them were essentially uh, by, by, had a bipedal gait. One of the most important or the most famous specimens um, of the Australopithecus uh, genus is called Australopithecus afarensis. Um, also known as Lucy. Uh, this was uh, excavated in Hadar, Ethiopia by somebody who is uh, very, very famous. Um, and um, and uh, this was the age, the, the, this, uh, the fossil remain has been dated to be about 3.2 million years. So that's about the time when Australopithecus arose. I said 4 million years. This is something that was excavated about 3.2 um, uh, million years ago. And uh, uh, the, the bottom line is a re reconstruction of the Afri uh, um, Australopithecus afarensis skull. And uh, this is about 70% uh, complete male skull that was found in bits and pieces uh, in, in this particular site in Ethiopia. Um, Australopithecus afarensis, uh, like I said, Australopithecus as a genus spent most of its time on two feet. And we now have um, a prominent uh, example or a prominent evidence that was discovered by a very famous uh, lady. Her name is Mary Leakey. The Leakey family spent uh, their generations in, um, in Africa, in different um, countries in Africa, essentially uh, digging bones and fossils and uh, reconstructing evolution. So this was discovered in 1975 by Mary Leakey. Uh, and this is uh, um, a, a bed, a volcanic ash bed on which somebody, whoever it was, somebody walked and uh, I can't read these footprints, but whoever can, uh, people who have the expertise to read these footprints will vouch that this was whoever walked on this had a bipedal gait. And uh, this rock bed has been um, has been dated to be uh, 3.7 million years. So we believe that uh, Australopithecus, the dominant uh, genus at that point of time, walked on this volcanic ash bed, and the footprints got embedded there. And uh, this this also jives with uh, the time that about four million years ago Australopithecus arose, and they spent most of their time on two feet. Um, so this is a this is a testimony to an upright gait. So we moved from being quadrupedal to a bipedal uh, as a species as a as a genus. This upright stance seems to have set in motion a profound evolutionary trend. Um, as a result of our walking on two feet, uh, we seem to gain something in evolution, and we seem to speed up evolution in some ways. First of all, hands became free to use for a manipulation. And when the hands become free, um, you can throw stones at predators. So two of the hand, hands uh, became free and you could then uh, essentially uh, impact on natural selection, meaning that predators wouldn't be able to get you uh, or would be less probable to get you and eat you up. So you can actually throw stones at predators. The second is that uh, once you're able to stand upright, you can uh, see higher over the underbrush because at that time, in the savannas in Africa, where many of them lived, uh, essentially there was a lot of underbrush 
And unless you could see um, uh, over the underbrush and spot predators at a distance, you wouldn't be able to use uh, or save yourself from the predators uh, by throwing stones, even if you did, unless you could spot them from a distance. So visibility over higher underbrush essentially meant, again, uh, together, um, using hands for manipulation and visibility over a higher underbrush meant that overall there was a decline in mortality uh, due to predation. Uh, the third is that uh, there was also a simultaneous increase in uh, brain size and there was a dramatic increase in brain size. We do not know whether this was due to bipedality. So this was just a concomitant feature that happened when we became bipedal, our brains also grew. Uh, whether this is a cause and effect, we would never know. But uh, this is this is an association that one finds between brain size and uh, ability to walk on two feet. <clears throat> That was about 4 million years ago. We jumped 2 million years and come to the origins of the genus Homo. Uh, genus, genus Homo, uh, rep earliest representatives were Homo erectus or Homo ergaster about 2 million years ago, and they also arose in Africa. One of the questions that you might, might ask is, why is everything happening in Africa? Why is there so much evolution happening in Africa? We would never know. This is a million dollar question, and we would never know uh, the true answer as to why uh, all of this uh, evolution is taking place in Africa. But be that as it may, about 2 million years ago, Homo erectus uh, arose in Africa, and Homo erectus was able to use stone tools. Um, they were tool makers and uh, they could use stone tools. Um, Homo erectus uh, could also move around and Homo erectus um, fossils have been found in Java about 2 million years ago. Now it's unclear when there was parallel evolution of Homo erectus in Java and in Africa. Uh, again, something that uh, has been hotly debated and I don't think that it's a, a proper resolution has actually been attained. So um, this is what it is. This is uh, a fossil that has been uh, the one, the picture on the right hand side is a fossil uh, of a young man, of a young boy uh, that was excavated from Kenya and has been, uh, and has been dated to be 1.6 million years. <clears throat> Uh, so th about 2 million years, these um, uh, the genus Homo arrived, and uh, uh, along with the arrival of this genus, it began to spread off new varieties of new species of Homo. So we have a large number of species called Homo robustus, habilis, ergaster, or erectus, um, uh, which arose between 1 and 2 million years ago, who evolved one between 1 and 2 million years ago, followed by the Heidelberg man, the Neanderthal man, and eventually man the man, Homo sapiens. So this is uh, this is essentially um, the timeline to our uh, evolution. And I said that I probably took a little bit more than five minutes, but this is my <coughs> um, storytelling of the first five years when we uh, split from uh, great apes and became uh, and and moved to evolve to modern humans. I uh, do want to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about uh, these two species that I talked to you about, Heidelberg man and Homo sapiens, also Erectus. <clears throat> uh, about one, one million years ago, Erectus arose, uh, like, I, like one shows in this picture, I've shown in this picture. Uh, Erectus arose about one million years ago, and then we, um, there were other kinds of uh, Homo species. Uh, Homo Erectus, actually, this uh, they, they, they died, died they died, the, 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 that evolutionary branch became extinct. There was another homo spe uh, species that arose, which is called uh, antecessor, and there were others called homo uh, flor um, floresiensis uh, in the Flores Islands uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, but again, all of these branches of homo um, uh, died and, uh, and became uh, extinct. Uh, one major branch that led to the Heidelberg man, the Neanderthal man, and now the Denisovans and uh, eventually the Homo sapiens, that's the dominant branch that survived. So I do wish to spend, uh, I'm going to refer to the, well, not so much the Heidelberg man, but the Neanderthal man and the Denisovans in the context of Homo sapiens because they are the most, uh, uh, in terms, in evolutionary time scale, they are our nearest neighbors, the Neanderthal man and the Denisovans. I'll tell you a little bit more about the Denisovans. You may or may not have heard about the Denisovans. So this is this is a recreation of Homo Heidelberg man um, uh, or the uh, Homo Heidelberg gensis. Um, this is Heidelberg man, and as you can see that 
uh, it could be uh, you know your uncle or your brother uh, we couldn't tell the difference so it was almost uh, like us they looked almost like us uh, arose about uh, 400,000 to 300,000 years ago about 150,000 years ago the branch that led to the Neanderthals the Dinosaurs from the Heidelberg um, man uh, it was a separate branch that led to the Homo sapiens so we would never know what happened to or for a long time uh, um, today Neanderthals don't exist the Neanderthals don't exist it's only the Homo sapiens that exist and for a long time it was debated what happened to the uh, Neanderthals at that time we didn't know about the Neanderthals but Neanderthals were widespread and the people knew about the Neanderthals and most people felt that the Neanderthals were actually uh, killed and made to become extinct by the Homo sapiens who were better uh, tool makers and tool users. But we will revisit this argument uh, in a minute. So, like I said, that part two of our story will begin from about uh, 130,000 years, like I showed you, 150,000 years to 130,000 years is when uh, modern humans arose, Homo sapiens arose, and a part two of our um, story begins then, begins now. Uh, so the origin of the modern humans, modern humans are less heavily built compared to our uh, ancestral uh, species, uh, Homo erectus uh, and other. We are more mobile um, and we have a higher cognitive, cognitive flexibility. Uh, we arose in Africa about 130,000 years ago. Again, I repeat that these times when I mention uh, the time date, the dates that I mentioned uh, have, comes with the large standard deviation and therefore 130 could be 100, could be 150, we're never sure. Um, the, um, we all arose in Africa and moved out of Africa to populate other parts of the world. Like I said, that we arose about 130,000 years ago. Um, so we moved out of Africa and out of Africa is a, a very famous film um, uh, with uh, Meryl Streep and uh, Robert Redford. Those of you who have uh, seen this film, it's a very fine film, it's a recreation. Uh, there's a lot, little bit of fiction uh, in this film, but it's also um, uh, embedded in uh, our evolutionary past. So it's called Out of Africa. So we uh, evolved in Africa, moved out of Africa. Where in Africa did we uh, evolve? Again, the most likely place where we evolved is the Ethiopia, Kenya region. That's where the oldest uh, fossils have been found. Um, when we evolved, we were probably a small group of people. Um, it's likely that we were a small group of people. Um, and uh, what our ancestors did was to hunt. They were hunted hunter gatherers, so they uh, wanted to. They, they had to survive, and they hunted deer, hare, etc. Remember that they were tool makers. It's not like they could make bows and arrows, but they certainly could make uh, stone flints and uh, uh, used to hunt deer, uh, hare, etc. And they were gatherers as well. They gathered nuts, berries, and so on. Uh, they look like us, uh, high forehead, a sharp chin, light, graceful bodies. So that's uh, that that that's uh, uh, you know one of our great great ancestors, and uh, you know exactly in you know, a high forehead, uh, chin, and so on and so forth. So this is this is a recreation of one of our uh, great ancestors, um, Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, many other human-like creatures lived at that time elsewhere in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, they were noticeably different from us. They, were, they had a low forehead, heavy ridges above the eyes. Uh, about a million of these archaic humans uh, vanished, and the last of them only 30,000 years ago. So they lived for a long time, about from about 1 million years to about 30,000 years, and um, these, these are archaic humans because they were human-like, but not exactly humans. We will never know how they vanished, and uh, uh, so I'm actually talking about the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Uh, we will never know how they vanished. Perhaps we overreproduced. We are very great, great reproducers, much better than our ancestors. So we probably overreproduced, outnumbered them, and uh, because we were able to outnumber them, we likely killed them. So that's that's uh, that was the dominant argument. Um, so I, I said this that about we arose about 130,000 years ago, and but today we occupy all places uh, in this universe, and so we must have come out of Africa. And the best date that we came out of Africa is about a hundred, uh, is about 60 to 80,000 years ago. So around that time we came out of Africa to populate 
uh, other parts of the world. Today, there are six billion of us. Every one of us descended from that small group of anatomically modern humans. We must recognize this. We must become very, very sober that in spite of the fact that we are fighting with each other all the time, we always we are have a common ancestry and therefore we are all brothers and sisters. We are siblings in some ways. We all derive from that small group of anatomically modern humans. <clears throat> Millions of us have lived and died, but fossilized remains of only a few few hundred exist. So to be able to recreate the story of human evolution based on fossilized remains is a great burden of speculation that imposes a great burden of speculation primarily because of the small numbers. So is there any other way to to um, reconstruct evolution, reconstruct our evolutionary past? And of course there is. Today we know that there is. Uh, we use uh, genetic data in order to recreate our evolutionary past. So our, another source of evidence is DNA, not just fossils and DNA uh, are in plenty. <clears throat> so we came out of Africa. And we saw that we were not alone. We met at least two other species of hominid cousins. Remember this hominid line of descent that separated from uh, the great apes from uh, about five billion years ago. So that's the hominid line of descent. When we modern humans came out of Africa, um, we met with uh, our hominid cousins, two of them. Uh, one was the Neanderthals that we are all familiar with. They roamed about many places, uh, had a wide uh, dispersal over Asia, um, over Europe and so on. But uh, there was also another cousin that we met. They are called Denisovans. And uh, the way that we know that they are cousins is because again, using uh, genetic data primarily, the, uh, the, um, a finger bone was found in a cave in Siberia called the Denisova cave. And that's the reason why uh, this cousin has been called the Denisovan. And um, DNA was isolated from this finger bone and compared with the Neanderthal DNA and compared with the human DNA. And it was quite evident that this finger bone came from a distinct species. And that species is called the Denisovan or that <coughs> group of individuals is called, are called the Denisovans named after the cave where uh, the, the first remain was found. Now, Today, a few more uh, have been found, not very many, not as many as the Neanderthals, but a few more uh, have been found. <laughs> so the uh, using genetic data, then we started to uh, understand or we started to ask ourselves what happened to uh, the Denisovans and Neanderthals when humans were uh, came out of Africa and why did these Denisovans and Neanderthals vanish? And like I said, that the dominant uh, story was that we overreproduced and killed them. We uh, exterminated them. But when we looked at uh, uh, when our uh, when geneticists looked at um, the the kind of relationship, genetic relationships among these three, the two of the ancestral cousins, uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans, and uh, we look at modern humans, what we found is that it's very interesting that we actually interbred. We interbred. Modern humans interbred with the Neanderthals, interbred with the Denisovans because uh, through interbreeding, Neanderthals gave us bits and pieces of their DNA. Denisovans gave up gave bits and pieces of their uh, of their DNA, and therefore today we know that there was admixture among the Denisovans, Neanderthals, and modern humans. Why did the Neanderthals and Denisovans then become extinct? Um, the dominant story now is again based primarily on genetics is that when there was a reproduction between Neanderthals and modern humans, the offspring um, of the of this mating went with the modern human group. Uh, that was the dominant group at that time and they went with the, the offspring went with the modern human group. So usually uh, after a period of time, then the Neanderthals actually grew small, grew to be smaller and smaller in size and eventually they, um, they, they became extinct. Um, same, same, the same thing happened with the Denisovans. So this is this is how things have happened. So we didn't make war with uh, Denisovans and Neanderthals. We actually made love with them and we reproduced and it's just that their offspring was assimilated, was absorbed in our own uh, societies as opposed to uh, the Neanderthal or the, or the Neanderthal society. <clears throat> in this process, there was another discovery that was made. 
that there were bits and pieces of DNA that uh, were contributed by uh, somebody else and some other cousin, some other ancestral cousin whose fossil remains had not been discovered. So genetic data has these kinds of uh, advantages that you can make discoveries, but because fossil remains are so hard to uh, sustain or retain, uh, you may not have found the fossil remains because of weathering, because of uh, uh, you know other kinds of climate changes, etc. Fossil remains have not been found, but there is a potential unknown hominin, or there may be more uh, potential uh, hominins, and they have contributed to the genomes of the modern humans as well. So, like I said, they were reproductively, uh, sorry for this uh, spelling mistake, reproductively more successful, and they were the Neanderthals and the Denisovans were absorbed in the much larger human population. Um, how do we infer? We generate genome score scale data from relevant species or individuals. We set up plausible scenarios. So, for example, uh, we may have killed them in one go. We may have absorbed them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, we set up different scenarios and we test these scenarios using statistical analysis of genome scale data. So, at the base of it all, genome scale generation of genome scale data is important, and setting up certain hypotheses uh, that uh, that uh, um, correspond to certain plausible scenarios is uh, are, are set up and using these genetic data then you test those scenarios. So the raw genome data we know all look like this. The most important portions of the raw genome data are these. Uh, so each row corresponds to an individual um, and uh, so there are multiple individuals. The same uh, portion of the DNA is being displayed and what we see is that with respect to certain positions it's all the same. Those positions are called all the same across individuals. Those positions are called monomorphic positions. And in the, then there are a few positions where there are uh, differences in the nucleotide uh, at that position, and those are called polymorphic positions. Then we make the information about uh, evolution, about our evolutionary past, migration, come only from these polymorphic positions and do not come from the monomorphic positions because they don't contain any information at all. With respect to the polymorphic positions, uh, we also um, depend uh, uh, a lot on um, you know, the, the uh, minor allele, the variant that is at a lower uh, frequency. What is the frequency of that particular minor allele? So if not just what, whether or not, whether or not there is a, a nucleotide change, but also the variant nucleotide's frequency comes into uh, force or comes into play in reconstructing human evolution. Uh, I just said this, that we generate data, we set up hypothesis, we contrast hypothesis using genomic scale data, and uh, then we try and distinguish between what may be more plausible than another hypothesis. And uh, like I just pointed out that uh, this whole business of um, introgression of um, uh, Denisovan and Neanderthal genomes into the human genome uh, turned out to be more likely hypothesis uh, based on genomic data. <coughs> So uh, let me let me just uh, show you three genomes, the black genome, the red genome, and the green genome. As you can see that the black genome, predominantly black genome, also has some bits and pieces of the red genome uh, and the green genome. Similarly, the other two genomes as well. Um, so the, the red genome, um, uh, the red bit in the black genome must have been obtained from the predominantly black genome. Similarly, the black genome in the green, the black portion uh, in the green genome must have been obtained from the predominantly black genome. Um, similarly, the green genome in the black uh, genomes part, the green portion in the black genomes part was obtained from the predominantly uh, green genome. So these, these are the kinds of things, uh, arguments that we make. And the black genome is a Neanderthal, the uh, uh, red genome is a Denisovan. Um, this, this is just figuratively speaking. Uh, and the green genome is uh, the human. Uh, like I said, when the Neanderthal and humans reproduce and they, they, they produce children, these offspring went with the humans. And that is an explanation as to why uh, the uh, Neanderthal Neanderthals uh, vanished from the face of this planet and, um, uh, and and the humans became the dominant one at, at the expense of Neanderthal and Denisovans, but it was not because we clubbed them to death, but because we absorbed their children. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, 
So uh, this is something that uh, we also discovered, and by we, I mean uh, our group. Um, when we were studying uh, two, um, two tribal populations in Andaman and Nicobar Islands called Jarwas and Onges, and we've been interested in studying the evolution of various population groups of India, and uh, we sampled a gene or sampled a DNA or sampled, uh, obtained blood samples from Jarwas and Onges, isolated DNA sequence the genomes, um, of the Jarwas and Onges, and uh, we uh, looked at uh, the composition of the uh, genomes of the Jarwas and Onges, and we have done so for various um, uh, many many uh, populations, many many ethnic groups that are present in mainland India, and Jarwas and Onges are from the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, as uh, as you know. And what we found was that in the Jarwas and Onges, there were these. Um, bits of uh, yellow in their uh, bits of yellow in their uh, genomes and these uh, bits of yellow did not come from neanderthals or denisovans and we uh, sort of um, timed these uh, or tried to find the ancestral uh, time of these yellow pieces and they went back to approximately the same time when neanderthals and denisovans um, you know roamed around uh, in, on the face of this earth so essentially what what our work pointed to is that uh, when the neanderthals and denisovans were roaming at about freely on our planet there was another um, uh, ancestor who was also present whose fossils have not been found but their genetic remains have or genetic uh, traces have been found in the traces of jarwas and onges but these have not been found in any of the populations of mainland india jarwas and onges that is as you know are um, very uh, characteristically African looking, and uh, we don't have similar uh, populations in mainland India except perhaps one uh, called the Kadar in Kerala, but uh, these are distinctly uh, different looking, and their genomes contain uh, distinct pieces that cannot be traced back to any of the known ancestors. So we postulated, uh, and, and uh, incidentally, some of the, not in main, mainland India, but we also looked at genomes of some of the population groups of Southeast Asia, and we found that these uh, uh, yellow pieces were also in, in the genomes of some population groups of Southeast Asia. So essentially, some Southeast, some Southeast Asian populations and some, uh, and the populations of Jarwas and Ongis had uh, introgression of uh, this particular uh, genomes of from this particular ancestor whose fossil remain has not been found. So we uh, postulated that it uh, provides an in insight into ancient migration into Asia and adaptation. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to talk about the adaptation bit, but it did provide us with uh, the existence of uh, another uh, another of our ancestors aside from Minnesovans and. Um, ne Neanderthals, and uh, it, it prompted to uh, the existence of other kinds of hominins, just as we had seen before. Uh, potential unknown hominin is what I had said in that particular slide. I'm not going to explain this. Uh, interestingly enough, after our paper was published, uh, and our paper was published uh, uh, in uh, that, that's the title of the paper that we wrote, and it was published in Nature Genetics. Subsequent to that, or very shortly thereafter, um, uh, in the American Society of Human Genetics meeting, there was another um, an another um, study that was uh, presented, and the study um, was among the Melanesians. And the Melanesians also, the, 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 this study also concluded this was a genetic study, and this study, uh, um, you know, um, tried to reconstruct the um, uh, um, reconstruct the uh, past of um, evolutionary past of the Melanesians, and they came came to the conclusion that the Melanesians have a complex evolutionary past, yet uh, they were able to find uh, evidence uh, for interbreeding with a mysterious hominid. Mysterious in this case means that they couldn't identify whether it came from the Neanderthals or from the Denisovans, uh, and therefore this, they called it as a mysterious hominin. Very similar to what we found in um, in uh, Southeast Asia and in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So we still don't know whether their mysterious hominin is the same as our un unknown hominin. Uh, our meaning the Jarwas and Ongis uh, unknown hominin that we identified. Humans are unusual animals. We have a very wide geographical distribution and we have adapted ourselves to a wide range of environmental conditions. And the important part is that we choose mates from uh, our own group. 
and the group is being uh, is defined in various ways, culturally, geographically, etc. But we tend, to, however, it's defined. We tend to choose mates from within our own group. As a result of tending tending to mate within our own group, genetic variations that evolve within the group tend to remain localized within the group, and ge genetic differences uh, that and because. Um, because because uh, you know different genetic uh, characteristics evolve in different uh, population groups and tend to remain localized within the groups. Uh, these groups become uh, over a period of time dis um, distinguishable, and uh, uh, each one um, retains some measure of their genetic distinctiveness. So the uh, distinct identities of the groups. Uh, happen after a certain period of evolution and uh, they are able to retain some of the uh, genetic distinctiveness primarily because these genetic variations remain within the group uh, primarily because these individuals uh, individuals tend to marry within the within the group so if you look at evolution of uh, human populations particularly over time uh, essentially we have a small group of individuals and we are looking at uh, uh, looking forward in time Essentially, we uh, talk about uh, looking forward in time, but uh, eventually turn the arrow of time backwards in order to um, um, uh, you know, strengthen our arguments. So this small group of individuals, because we reproduce so well, uh, we grow in population size, we grow in demographic size, and uh, this growth take, takes place. And once the growth take, takes place, because remember, we are still hunter, hunter gatherers, we depend on uh, what's, whatever is available around us, when there, when there is population growth, there is more mouths to free feed, uh, yet the natural resources then start um, being fine. Natural resources are finite and they become uh, come to be depleted. And in order to sort of maintain ourselves, in order to uh, maintain our living, a small band of these people will move away to another geographical region and the remaining people will stay there so that there is lesser pressure on natural resources and they're able to um, uh, feed the more uh, greater number of mounts that happen. So uh, one group will move away to another place and uh, this the, the, the remaining group will stay and exactly the same phenomenon keeps happening over and over time. Uh, there is expansion of populations and movement to new places, etc. Most of these individuals in the new places will remain um, within uh, or will reproduce uh, within themselves. But sometimes there is that mixture and sometimes there is exchange of genes between uh, two population groups thus formed. <clears throat> so what we try to do is to look at uh, contemporary populations at the bottom layer, these four populations, and try and look at their genetic um, makeup and uh, uh, reconstruct human evolution by uh, turning the arrow of time uh, backwards in the inverse fashion as, uh, uh, as depicted in this particular graph. Um, there are, of course, barriers to admixture. I said that some of these groups will admix, but most of these groups tend to remain uh, localized without admixture, uh, tend to remain unadmixed. And there are major barriers to admixture. One is a geographical barrier. Imagine, if you will, that there are two um, population groups on two si sides of the Himalayan mountain belt. There's hardly any possibility of them um, mating. So geographical barrier or a physical barrier forms a strong barrier to admixture. Then there are cultural differences and linguistic differences that also form barriers uh, to admixture. Um, one of the expectations that we have uh, from genetics is that uh, the populations that have uh, arisen earlier would have greater genetic diversity within that population. Why? Because many more mutations would have accumulated, many more genetic variations would have accumulated, and therefore uh, populations that have evolved a long time ago would have larger amount of genetic diversity compared to populations that would have um, uh, appeared later or evolved later. So uh, we uh, now look at genetic diversity among contemporary populations and we find that Africa has the largest amount of genetic diversity. This is consistent with fossil data, consistent with fossil data, uh, uh, fossil data also have shown that uh, African populations or humankind evolved in Africa and therefore the oldest uh, populations uh, are from Africa. The second most diverse populations are from Asia and Asia therefore was most likely populated was the first uh, land mass that was populated after humankind came out of Africa and therefore 
The second most uh, oldest, second oldest populations are found in Asia, followed by the other continents in Europe and Australia and so on. If we uh, look at uh, um, the genetic distinctiveness, uh, the genetic distinctiveness uh, also um, can be distinct across uh, two genders. So there are uh, y, chromosomal, um, y chromosomal patterns and X chromosomal patterns or mitochondrial patterns. So if you look at Y chromosomal patterns, uh, these patterns are called haplogroups and these haplogroups have funny names, but don't worry about the funny names. They have uh, some names like A, B, C, D, E. This is not so they, they have been given these names, these haplogroups uh, on, on your left. The ones that are on the left, A, B, C, etc. Incidentally, the, these are color coded. Uh, the ones on the left are the oldest, older haplogroups, meaning that those uh, signatures uh, um, on the Y chromosome arose earlier than the ones that are on your on your on your uh, uh, right hand side. So it's arranged in such a way that the oldest haplogroups, oldest signatures are on the left, and the newest signatures are on the right. If we uh, sample populations from around the world and ask ourselves where do we find the oldest signatures, you guessed right. The oldest signatures will be on the African continent. So the oldest sig signatures are on the Af African continent. And if you come to the new world, you find the newest uh, signatures like uh, Q and R and so on. So these are newer signatures. What does this point to? This points to uh, uh, humans having been uh, having evolved in Africa first, moving out of Africa to populate uh, Asia, where you find the Middle Ages uh, signatures, and uh, then moving on to populate uh, to cross the Bering Strait about 15, 20,000 years ago and populate uh, the New World, uh, the uh, uh, North and South America. And uh, these, these are, uh, these, these, this inference happens because they have the um, newest haplogroups. So these are Y haplogroups, so essentially uh, m uh, consistent with humans having evolved in Africa, moving up out of Africa, going through Asia, and then going to Australia and uh, other parts of the world, including the new world. If you look at mitochondria, mitochondria is present in all our cells, but the um, mitochondria that uh, you know, we receive uh, from in our cells, irrespective of gender, are all obtained from our mothers. The father, fathers play no role uh, in contributing mitochondria to our cells. Uh, these are extra cell, these are extra nuclear um, uh, organelles. And they have a genome, they have a have DNA, and we can sequence the DNA. And the DNA that uh, um, that's present in the individuals are all products of their mothers. So if you look at uh, the, um, uh, the, the variation in the mitochondrial DNA, this variation is all female derived. And so if you look at exactly the same thing, on your left, the signatures uh, in, that are the oldest, and on the right, the signatures that that are the newest, you find exactly the same trend. Again, the oldest signatures are in um, are, are, are in Africa. The Middle Ages signatures are in Asia, and the newest signatures are in the New World. Uh, so again, uh, male population movement and female population movement are consistent with uh, each other and uh, consistent with what I've just said: evolve in Africa, move out of Africa, etc. Uh, a few years ago, uh, this was in uh, 2009, about 10 years ago, <clears throat> um, we embarked on a major collaborative study, and this is a paper that was published in Science. Um, we embarked on a major collaborative study with various um, scientists from across various countries of Asia, and we reconstructed uh, the population, um, the ancestral components in the contemporary populations of Asia. And as you can see on the, the right hand panel, the right hand graph uh, essentially are colored and each color represents an ancestry and each uh, horizontal line represents a population. Uh, so the uh, relationships among the populations are depicted in the phylogenetic tree on the left and the names of the populations, which I'm sure you cannot read, uh, are, are given in the, in the middle. So uh, as you can see that in spite of the fact that, that we have studied a, a whole set of populations, uh, about 100 populations, you do what you find is that the total number of uh, ancestral populations is only about 10 or 12. 
And this happens irrespective of which country in Asia or which region in Asia they are inhabiting. If we, um, uh, this is an early divergence from um, India. And if you come to um, uh, India, and we had uh, a limited amount of data that we could um, actually, um, um, you know, in this collaborative study, we could uh, contribute. Uh, these are from uh, some populations from North and East India and some populations from South India. And what we find is that the ancestral components in North and East India is quite different from the ancestral component in uh, South India or the South Indian populations have an ancestral component that's distinct from the ancestral component of North and East India. So this was uh, the, the, the conclusion. And most interestingly, this is the root of the tree uh, towards the bottom. Uh, and uh, Indian populations branch out of this tree early on. So there is a, an early divergence of the Indian populations, which essentially means that there is a, a larger period of evolution of Indian populations, which also means that humankind came out of Africa and one of the first places that they entered uh, was India. So India uh, also carries a major is a, is a major torch bearer of uh, human evolution. If we look at ethnic composition of India, there are tribal populations, and these numbers come from <coughs> anthropological survey of India. There are 450 distinct tribal populations with a simple social organization and occupation. Um, they have they speak languages that belong to uh, three linguistic families. Austroasiatic, Dravidian, and Tibeto Burman. Uh, there are one or two tribal populations that speak uh, Indo European languages, but most linguists believe that this has been imposed on them and this is not their original language. Uh, then there are caste populations, including the caste, including the sub caste. There are about 4,000 of them. They have a complex uh, hierarchical social organization as opposed to a simple social organization of the tribal populations, and they carry out a variety of occupations. Uh, they speak languages that belong to three linguistic groups in the European, Dravidian, and Tibeto Burman. And then we have a bunch of uh, religious and migrant groups, about 150 of them, Parsis, Iranis, and so on and so forth. Uh, they, uh, they have a very similar uh, hierarchical social organization as our caste populations. And they also carry out a whole uh, set of uh, varied uh, occupations. They speak languages that uh, belong to Indo European, Dravidian, or Tibeto Burman language families. Um, if you have not noticed, uh, the, uh, the uh, Austroasiatic uh, family of speech only belongs to the tribals. The caste populations or the religious and migrant groups do not speak languages that belongs to the Austroasiatic language of speech. Um, we uh, again did uh, a large scale genomic study of various populations uh, of India and we did the study with 42 ethnic groups and we did whole genome sequencing, so 3 billion uh, nucleotides that we have in our genome were sequenced and all jointly analyzed in order to get to certain kinds of inferences. And we uh, we also um, carried out a Illumina 1 million SNP array for certain kinds of uh, quality check and also um, other kinds of reasons of, um, of contrasting our uh, joint genome analysis uh, with these kinds of um, Analysis. The first thing that we identified was that there was um, Neanderthal admi admixture. So let me explain this figure. At the on the y-axis are the various uh, pop on our various populations, 42 of them, and on the x-axis, uh, I'm sorry, uh, on the y-axis, the heights of these black bars represent the extent of Neanderthal admixture. As you can see, that the extent of Neanderthal admixture is not too much, from about two to 2.5 percent. And uh, so roughly all populations carry the same extent of Neanderthal at, at mixture, uh, even though, you know, the, because of the scaling of the x-axis, y-axis, uh, these differences show up. The second is Denisovan. There's also Denisovan admixture. Denisovan admixture is much lower than Neanderthal admixture, uh, between 0.1% uh, and 0.4% uh, of uh, the human genomes uh, in India. Uh, comprised Denisovan genomes, and so that's uh, the extent of Denisovan admixture. However, Denisovan admixture shows certain patterns which uh, Neanderthal admixture does not show. So Denisovan admixture uh, shows that the tribal populations have the maximum amount of Denisovan ancestry, um, followed by um, followed followed by 
the caste populations uh, and even the caste populations, the upper caste populations have the upper caste populations that are predominantly the Brahmins. Uh, they have the lowest amount of release of an ad, uh, admixture. So uh, essentially, there is a very nice gradation uh, by, tri by tribal through the um, caste hierarchy uh, to Pakistan. PK is Pakistan. So Pakistan has the smallest amount of uh, release of an ad, uh, ancestry. We don't know why this has happened, but it's likely that uh, the, the uh, ancestral tribal populations reproduce with the divisovans more than the other populations. We then asked, uh, um, using these kinds of data, genetic data, how many distinct ancestral types are there in the populations of our country? Uh, like we saw in, um, in Asia, when we sampled about 100 populations, contemporary populations, we found evidence of about uh, 10 to 12 different um, uh, ancestral populations. How many distinct ancestral types do we get in India? And this is, uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, before we published our uh, paper, uh, there, were, there was another paper that was uh, published by uh, a combined group from uh, Broad Institute and from CCMB uh, in India. And that combined group essentially pointed pointed to two um, ancestral populations. One they call it as the ancestral North Indian, and the other they call it as the ancestral South Indian. Uh, but their uh, their uh, sampling was inadequate. Uh, they uh, essentially sampled an inadequate number of population groups. Also, uh, it was uh, they had done some selection on the population group as a result of which. Um, you know, they found uh, only two um, pop two ancestral populations. Um, we uh, went ahead and uh, did our population sampling in a more unbiased manner and included uh, the Andaman and the Cobalt Islands. And, and this is a, a principal components plot. The first two principal components based on the about a million SNP data on about a million um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, if you look at these two, this uh, plot, what one? This is first of all color coded by uh, different population groups, and if you look at the Jarwas and the Ongis, uh, who are from uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, as you can see that uh, they are they are completely um, uh, you know situated uh, separate, uh, differently compared to the populations of mainland India. This straight line is essentially populations of mainland India. So the um, uh, islanders are quite distinct from the mainlanders is a, a conclusion that we derived from uh, this particular uh, uh, plot of uh, the first two principal genetic principal components. <clears throat> then we looked at, uh, sorry, uh, we looked at uh, inland populations and we looked at 18 inland populations in great detail um, that, that were uh, both uh, tribal and caste populations uh, sampled from different uh, geographical regions of India, and what we see is uh, that there is a deep population uh, subclustering. Uh, these populations to the top right hand corner are populations from northeast of India um, uh, and, and Jamatias, Sripuris, and so on um, from northeast of India. And then we have uh, this Y, uh, inverse Y like uh, structure, and uh, these, these are various components. The uh, top of the Y. Um, are essentially um, North Indians, and then you have um, uh, Central and South Indians in the bottom of that uh, of this fork. Uh, and again, this is a principal component analysis of about a one million genetic uh, SNP data. So that's uh, Northeast, and these are two distinct components, South and Central, and that's a Northern component. So North, South, Central, and Northeast. Uh, this is how it separates out. And essentially, if we do an admixture analysis based on the genetic data, we find that there are four ancestral populations. So let me explain this graph on the bottom. Uh, these are individuals sampled from multiple populations. So there are thousands of them uh, on the bottom, thousand dots in the bottom, and the y-axis represents the proportion of, um, uh, of an ancestry, and uh, each color represents uh, one kind of ancestry. So you'll see that there are four different colors, um, and these four colors of, uh, represent the four different ancestral types. And uh, if you uh, try and then superimpose the geography from which uh, each of these uh, individuals come from, um, you find that, well, not geography, but language, then most of the ones on the left are more Indo-Europeans. They are primarily green, 
with some uh, little bit of uh, primarily green ancestry with a little bit of the uh, sky blue and red ancestry. Uh, the middle is essentially Dravidian populations of southern India, mostly red, predominantly one single um, ancestral type. The Austroasiatic populations are tribal populations from central India, like the Santals, the Mundas, and so on, and they are predominantly the sky blue. And uh, the Tibeto Burman populations who are from northeast of India are uh, predominantly dark blue. So, um, when the, the, uh, in India, there is an overlap or there is a, uh, um, yeah, there, there's, there's a confounding between language and uh, geography, Indo-European population that's spoken in the north, Dravidian population that's spoken in the south, Austroasiatic populations are um, uh, um, languages that are spoken primarily in the central parts of India and tibeto burman pop, uh, languages are spoken in northeast of India. So these languages actually re represents geographies. And so we essentially have four ancestral populations that have contributed to the contemporary uh, diversity of uh, the populations in India. Uh, we published this paper of ours in the proceedings of the US National Academy. Um, I uh, do want to um, uh, end my talk with a few. Uh, I will take uh, maybe 10 more minutes um, with, a, with a few interesting uh, uh, kind of anecdotes, but scientific anecdotes. Uh, when we when we talk about population movements, like I said, that usually there is a population expansion um, uh, and pressure on natural resources, and that leads to migration to new areas. Now, in terms of uh, migration to new areas, if you talk about a specific uh, kind of um, a movement uh, of an idea, then uh, an idea can be moved to another place without physical movement of people. Um, or there can be actually physical movement of people who takes this idea and um, you know exports it to another place. Uh, one such idea is, uh, for example, farming. Farming is um, is an idea. Farming is a technology. A technology can be um, you know, can move from one place to another. Uh, maybe I mean you can hypothesize that people can narrate how this technology is done. People can narrate the technology of farming to people elsewhere and they can then, uh, the people elsewhere then can then adopt. So there is no physical movement of people and that kind of uh, uh, diffusion is called cultural diffusion. Diffusion of technologies or ideas is called uh, cultural diffusion. Then you have actually uh, farming where you have a bunch of farmers from one place go to another place and teach those uh, people in that other place uh, how to uh, till land and uh, grow, uh, you know, cultivate agriculture, uh, and that that will involve movement of people physically, and that's called demic diffusion. And as you can imagine, being geneticists, we try to figure out uh, what's the difference between these two kinds of, um, uh, you know, export. Uh, one is that when there is cultural diffusion, there is no movement of genes, no movement of people. When there is demic diffusion, there is movement of people, and hence there is movement of genes. Genes, of course, uh, we know move with people. So let's see what happened, uh, how uh, modern agriculture arose. So modern agriculture arose, again, I'm not going to provide you with uh, the detailed evidence that have been found by people who study fossilized, uh, you know, fossilized uh, uh, pollen grains and so on, but modern human, uh, modern agriculture uh, arose in what's called the fertile crescent region. Um, which is uh, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, that particular region, uh, which in this graph is shown with the uh, uh, color of highest intensity, um, the brownish color with the highest intensity. And as you move out from the, uh, from the uh, Fertile Crescent region, the color becomes uh, less and less intense, becomes more and more dull. Um, this, is, this is a plot of uh, uh, um, uh, frequencies of one particular haplogroup uh, called haplogroup J, a Y chromosomal haplogroup called haplogroup J. And uh, what it shows is that <coughs> this haplogroup is the most intense in um, the fertile crescent region where agriculture arose. And um, as one moves out of this region, uh, the, the frequency diminishes, but it diminishes gradually. Uh, this is consistent with the notion 
that agriculture, after it arose in the Fertile Crescent region, people from that region actually took the technology of farming, technology of agriculture to adjacent regions, and therefore lesser and lesser impact of the genes uh, that are that are characteristic of the Fertile Crescent region is seen as you move out of the Fertile Crescent region. So two um, uh, take home messages. One is that uh, the technology of agriculture uh, arose with that arose in the Fertile Crescent region was actually taken by people from that region gradually in a sequential fashion to other parts of the world in order to um, uh, explain the technology of farming and have people in that new region adopt the technology of farming. This, is, uh, this was the picture when we began our work. We expanded this work into India and uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, we expanded, uh, this, this work was published by the American Journal of Human Genetics. We uh, expanded this work and moved Sorry for the change in color, but it's essentially the same picture. Um, we changed from uh, brown to uh, purple, but uh, you essentially see, see the same picture. Um, the, the same trend uh, also moves into India. So essentially, uh, farmers from the um, uh, you know, Fertile Crescent region uh, gradually, sequentially taught people uh, in other regions, including in India. Uh, and, and in India, you also see that there are epicenters, another epicenter in the northeast, like uh, northeast of India and uh, another epicenter, whoops, uh, another epicenter in southern India. But those, those, those are uh, rudimentary forms of agriculture that may have arose in India, but actually did not move out of India and did not spread far and wide. So modern tech, uh, agriculture moved um, into India from uh, in the same wave of migration from the Fertile Crescent region, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, into India. So we have adopted the modern form of technology. And uh, uh, this is very interesting because um, genes can actually inform how technologies have moved and how technologies have come into new places. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to take uh, five more minutes and end my talk. Um, the, I've talked about evolution. But uh, this evolution, as I said, that older populations have much larger genetic diversity. They have uh, newer kinds of variants. They have newer, uh, um, more um, you know, differences in uh, frequencies of these variants. And these are all related to, uh, or many of them are actually related to predisposition to various kinds of diseases, responses to drugs, uh, interactions with environmental factors, propensity to infections, and progressions of diseases. You may not believe that you know Neanderthals and Denisovans studying any of these will actually tell us anything about um, our own disease burden, uh, our own responses to drugs, but actually they do. And uh, uh, just give me a, yes, I, this uh, this slide is the first one that I want to show you. Uh, actually, they do, and very recently, this is 26 November uh, 2020, after the um, coronavirus uh, spread itself. Uh, far and wide, uh, uh, Zeberg and Savante Pebo. Savante Pebo is very, very famous for its uh, for his work on um, sequencing the Neanderthal genome and finally, and also the uh, the Denisovan genome. So they identified that the major risk factor for severe COVID-19 disease is inherited from the Neanderthals. One doesn't want to believe this. They they were able to identify some genetic risk factors for severe COVID-19 disease, and uh, these genetic factors root back or trace back to Neanderthals. This is extremely interesting because one uh, does not uh, want to believe that uh, studying the Neanderthal genome can have any can can inform about any um, you know disease or any predisposition to disease uh, in the human. So there is continuity of evolution, and uh, this is this is uh, something that was published uh, on uh, on 26 November. Uh, Nature. Uh, let me go back one slide. This is from our own work, and this is again something that we published in Nature. Um, it's a it's the same. It's a part of the same paper uh, that I where I described about uh, you know the you know, how many ancestral populations are there in Asia. Uh, so uh, this is. Uh, as you can see, our paper was uh, chosen for the cover page of Nature. Uh, but anyway, I want to just show you two pictures from our paper. Uh, one is this picture where uh, you have these various diseases, uh, various genes such as BRCA1, BRCA2, etc. And you find specific 
um, uh, specific variants and uh, variants that are high frequency in, um, uh, in in India, for example. So BRCA1, uh, these are there are uh, you know four four distinct uh, variants that are only found in India. Uh, one of this is essentially uh, essential splice splice site. Two of them are nonsense variants, and one is a frame shift variant found uh, only in uh, India. And similarly, for, with respect to the other genes, so study of these can actually uh, allow uh, study of these evolutionary and population variation um, tells us about uh, tells tells us about uh, various ge genetic variants uh, that are confined to certain kinds of genomic regions. Uh, and I'm only showing you India. The second picture that I want to show you, and you may not be able to see this very well, but this is responses to drugs. So, for example, if you look at warfarin uh, or clopidogrel, uh, these uh, these drugs, responses to these drugs, uh, or, or many individuals uh, develop a, an adverse uh, reaction to uh, drugs such as warfarin or clopidogrel, and these uh, um, the, the, the genes and the alleles in these genes that uh, produce these kinds of um, drug response have high frequencies in India. So by knowing the frequencies of certain kinds of genes, even before you administer a drug, you can predict whether that drug will have an adverse impact, provided you know which particular genetic variants are associated with adverse impact to the drug. So uh, study of these kinds of um, uh, population genetic or evolutionary phenomena also can inform human health and disease. I finally want to uh, uh, tell you, show you my last slide, which I think is the most important slide, uh, primarily because this kind of study about genetic diversity, genetic differences, also had lo has lots of social and ethical connotations. Uh, individuals, population groups have been discriminated, have, have been stigmatized by the study of these uh, genomic data or using these genomic data. And uh, uh, gen genetic diversity is something that we must um, uh, uphold and applaud as opposed to use those as a basis for social discrimination. And nobody could say this, uh, according to me, nobody has said this uh, as well as uh, Maya Angelou, who is a, uh, an African-American poet. And I want to read this out loud and clear, even though I know that you can read it yourself. But still, I want to read this out. It's time for the preachers, the rabbis, the priests and pundits, and the professors to believe in the awesome wonder of diversity so that they can teach those who follow them. It is time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. We all should know that diversity may, makes for a rich tapestry and we must understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter their color, equal in importance, no matter their texture. Thank you very much for your patience. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take questions, but uh, it's up to you. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's been truly uh, a privilege to listen to you today. The sheer scope of your talk, uh, where you have you know, covered <clears throat> the grand scheme of things in terms of human evolution, human migration, how technology and culture have impinged on genetic diversity and may have actually been interacting with it. Uh, and then finally, uh, to come down to, you know, very real world and current and topical areas uh, where genetic diversity uh, plays uh, what seems to be a, a critical role in terms of disease susceptibility, in terms of therapeutics, uh, in terms of, of, of what you may have it. So, uh, sir, uh, to begin with, thank you again. It's been truly magnificent uh, sitting here and listening. Um, I'd like to, uh, with your permission, open the uh, uh, forum for questions from the participants or other attendees. Anybody can uh, either type in the chat window or identify themselves and speak. That's so, uh, actually, sir, I'll begin with... Uh, <coughs> The uh, questions that are there in the box. Yeah, I, I see one uh, from Nandini. Can you please comment on the impact of large population of India and China 
on human genetic diversity and its implication for future evolution of mankind. I can't, I can't possibly uh, talk about future evolution of mankind uh, because uh, much of it has been sort of dominated by other kinds of pressures such as social pressures or technological pressures that impinge on human evolution. So in some ways, evolution is no longer as natural as it, as it used to be in the past. But I will say that it's not just the demographic size of the, uh, of the population, such as in India and China, that determines the course of evolution or determines the, uh, determines the uh, diversity. It's essentially uh, how old we are uh, in terms of our ancestral past. Uh, that determines the diversity. So it's not the, just the demographic size uh, or not necessarily the, the demographic size of our populations, but the antiquity of the contemporary populations that determines the past, not just the antiquity, but also uh, the extent of inputs in, from um, uh, multiple ancestries into the gene pool of that contemporary population that determines the diversity. Thank you, sir. So, uh, if we can move on to the next question from Dr. Akila, is there any evidence that we are continuing to evolve? Uh, so, like I said, it's uh, uh, very, very difficult. I mean, how long do we live? I mean, that's uh, minuscule in, in an evolutionary scheme of things. But uh, chances are that we are evolving, but it's going to be, you know, uh, several hundred, uh, seven thousand years later that uh, we will get to know how well we are evolving and how fast we are evolving. Um, there's no reason to believe that evolution has stopped. So we are evolving, except that it's going to be very, very difficult for us to uh, gauge the tempo and mode of evolution of, of, of ourselves. Sir, uh, there is a question right at the top. Uh, it's from Antra, uh, a scientist at our institute. It's a little, uh, well, verbose, but uh, I'd like to give it a shot if you don't mind. Uh, Please do. It says, thank you, Professor Majumdar, for the very insightful talk. Could you please apprise us about the Genome Asia 100K project with respect to its use as a reference for genetic studies from India? Another question, uh, and then there's, an, I guess, another question. So I'll read it out, sir, and then you can split up if you want. Another sure. question Another question with respect to non-synonymous variation. In certain genes of interest that have shown association with a particular disease in one ethnic population and may not show association, uh, present in some control samples, I guess, uh, in another ethnic population. So how does one infer in such cases? Uh, so you can take whichever question you feel like uh, in order or any way you want. Uh, so so I, I'll, I'll take both. Uh, the fact is uh, that the Genome Asia um, uh, data are available uh, for anybody to use and uh, they can be used as uh, control control data or reference data, depending on which particular region you're sampling from. Uh, it's a fairly representative and there are 42 populations that are included in that data set. So that's the answer to the first question. The answer to the second question is that you look at the same non-synonymous variant and you find it in association with a specific disease in one population, but do not find it in uh, another population. And this can, of course, happen because uh, you know most of these diseases that we study are kind of complex and it's because of interplay not only be, uh, it's dependent not only on one gene variant but interplay of multiple genomic variants and the environment and therefore until we understand the uh, you know interplay between with the other genomic variants just because it's not associated in another population we just can't uh, uh, conclude that that synonymous variant is uh, not uh, important that would be like throwing the baby with the bathwater having said this Oftentimes, what one finds is that these discrepancies arise because of limited sample size. You're doing case control association studies. Oftentimes, often, very often, uh, these studies are underpowered. And therefore, as you move from one population, inference of one population, you don't see it pan out in another population. And that's primarily because of sample size or predominantly or oftentimes because of small sample size. Thank you, sir. So, uh, if I had one question regarding uh, genetic exchange or genetic interaction, uh, you obviously spoke about uh, this kind of interaction at a species level within the same genus. Uh, I'd like to extend that uh, to something like a host and a pathogen. Uh, yes. So, if, if we if we were to you know consider this, uh, some may call it adversarial relationship, 
uh, of a host and a pathogen, uh, what would your thoughts be with respect to rates of evolution and so-called equilibrium uh, that a host and a pathogen, is that is that the ultimate outcome that uh, should happen and are, uh, you know, failures to do so, uh, you know, uh, uh, why we have these pandemics and diseases? Um, again, I mean, I uh, don't know whether I have understood your question, but I'll try to answer it in two ways. One is if we talk about a pathogen, there are two, obviously two genomes that one's lo looking at now, a host genome and a pathogen genome. Um, uh, the uh, first question that I'll answer is, can you find whether the pathogen genome has entered the human genome? I don't know if you ask this question, but if somebody asks me this question, I'll say, yes, there are indications. There are bits and pieces of the adenovirus genome uh, that you would find of multiple adenovirus genomes that you find in the, Indian, uh, in the human genome as well. So sometimes pathogen genomes have contributed to, the, to our own genomes. The second uh, um, part of the question, again, I'm paraphrasing on your behalf, is that here are two genomes, the pathogen genome and the human genome. And the pathogen genome is, of course, evolving much faster than the human genome. And uh, since the pathogen genome is evolving, the human genome is uh, responding to it in some ways through antibodies, etc. And uh, therefore, uh, is this a losing battle that human genome, because of its lower rate of um, uh, evolution, is unable to keep up with the pathogen genome and therefore uh, these kinds of pandemics? That's a good thought. I don't know if that was your question, but if that's your question, that's a good thought. I do not know um, whether that's the only. It was, sir. The, it was, no? sir. Thank you. It was. It was. Thank you. Okay. That was the question. Okay. So the uh, the uh, answer to that question is uh, essentially we still don't know that, especially with respect to that the, this particular pandemic. We are many of us are actually studying that. But we are just right now collecting samples because uh, we are so overwhelmed with this pandemic that there is not an opportunity to study. But with that in mind, we are actually sampling, um, um, you know, uh, viral genomes and human genomes to be able to study that at a later point of time. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, back to the uh, chat list. Uh, so there is a, a couple of questions here. So to begin with, uh, the human genome is, is sinking in since years, uh, says Alap Naigaukar, a PhD student actually in our institute. Can we say that it is a sign of successful evolution as the cells seem to require less protein coding genes? The human genome is shrinking? That's what Alap says. Sir. <laughs> I guess he, uh, may, he, may, he may be referring maybe to the, right. to the Y chromosome going a little shorter. I mean, this is what we've all... Oh, the telomeres? Yes, yes, maybe that's it. Oh, but telomeres have some other kind of function. Again, this is not the time for me to talk about telomeres. Um, no, but I, in general, I think it's 3 billion base pairs and has been constant uh, for quite a long time, except that with age, we lose a little bit of the telomeres and so on. But again, that's, I don't know. I, I don't know that the human genome is shrinking. All right, sir. Uh, uh, this is more of a, a kind of an advice uh, that somebody is asking, sir. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Anurag is asking if um, there is a book or a particular resource that you would like to recommend uh, for people to continue reading and, uh, you know, exploring this, uh, uh, this area in general. Uh, the uh, genomics or general evolution? So I think you could maybe give one for each. Um, well, I, uh, why don't I uh, send it to you tomorrow rather than if I'm going to uh, let me think about it because many books come to my mind. So let me think about it and send it to you tomorrow. Wonderful, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I think there was another question there about the Y chromosome and it's losing, uh, you know, uh, constant genetic uh, material. Uh, so I think that's from Deepak. So he says that... Uh, there is evidence of a Y chromosome losing genes. One, is there any evidence for it being, or for it occurring in the Indian population? Uh, and two, uh, would it reach equilibrium or continue to degenerate? Uh, this is very specific, and I have uh, I'm, I have no knowledge about this, so I would not like to make a comment. Okay, sir, no problem. Uh, 
and i think there is a, i think more about uh, a comment here about how the mitochondrial genome uh, can also kind of integrate and yes, yes yes of course of course of course uh, yeah so uh, yes there is evidence yes yes uh, so sir that 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 about wraps up the uh, the questions that we have so far um, uh, on behalf of of everybody listening uh, again i'd like to reiterate uh, uh, actually, sir, there is one question, one last minute question. It always happens just as we start to say thank you. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is a question here which says from Amit, is there any evidence whether this admixture, I'm assuming the admixture of genomes that you've been talking about, sir, reduces disease susceptibility or increases it? And has it been used for novel therapeutic approaches? I think you've spoken about it, sir, but if you want to uh, maybe... Where is that question? I, uh, okay, can you one more time read it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Is there any evidence whether this admixture reduces uh -huh. disease susceptibility or increases it? And has it been used for novel therapeutic? I'm guessing the word missing there is approaches. Oh, oh, we can't we can't uh, make a prediction of uh, whether admixture is going to reduce or increase. No, we can't make a prediction. Hmm. So I don't know. So he's mentioned the word admixture. So I'm guessing it's the admixture of genomes, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm assuming so. Uh, so uh, I guess you use you, your answer is that you can't make this prediction. No, we can't. We can't make a prediction. That's my answer. Okay, all right. Um, I think uh, 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 this is basically it, sir. Um, and I'd like to continue now and and say thank you. Uh, and we hope, sir, that you will stay engaged with us and and. Uh, we can reach out, especially the participants uh, to you uh, with any uh, further questions or, or advice that they may need. Uh, we thank you once again for being part of this, uh, you know, uh, training program and, and uh, wish you very well uh, and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I don't know who to uh, send this.